Uh, yes. Okay, okay, wonderful. Okay. So um, this talk is about compositionality, which uh, I think generally agreed is one of the most basic building blocks of grammar. And I've given here on the slide a rather commonplace definition of compositionality. What it says is that the meaning of a complex expression is determined by the structure and the meaning of its constituents. So the idea is that complex syntax semantics works by taking smaller meaning bearing units together to form larger meaning bearing units. And of course, this is the development of composition that is one of the um, central aspects of the development of the evolution of language in general. Now, what I'd like to do in this talk is to draw attention to an aspect of compositionality that hasn't received much attention, and that is its bipartite structure. Um, okay, so the idea is, if you look at this definition, it's actually bipartite, as indicated in the coloring tree. So the meaning of a complex expression is determined both by its structure and by the meanings of its constituents. What I want to do in today's talk is to tease these two apart, to propose a typology of compositionality, looks at each of these two parts uh, individually, and to ask what this might tell us about the evolution of language. Let's look at two similar sentences in English, the chicken is eating, and in the Indonesian, the corresponding sentence which I've written about at great length. The basic insight here is that in Indonesian, what the sentence means is basically anything that has to do with chicken and eating. In particular, there is no specification here for thematic roles. The chicken could be the agent of the patient. There is no specification for whether it's attributive, the chicken that is eating, or predicative, the chicken is eating. So there's actually a, a profound difference between these two sentences, even though the one is usually offered as the translation of the other. Sorry, I have trouble moving. So basically, the basic idea that I want to uh, put forward is that um, whereas in English, the compositional semantics, the, the meaning of the sentence is determined both by the meanings of its constituents and its structure. In Indonesian, it's determined only by the meanings of its constituents and not by its structure. And this distinction uh, is what I refer to in the title of this talk, which was revised slightly, as bare compositionality versus structural compositionality. So bare compositionality is the real Indonesian type, as illustrated in this, this particular example, where it's only the meanings of the um, expression, or the meanings of constituents that determine the meaning of the expression, versus constructional compositionality, where it's not just the meanings of the constituents, but also its structure. So basically what I'm suggesting is that sentence one exemplifies bare compositionality, whereas sentence two instantiates constructional compositionality. Now, in order to characterize bare compositionality, uh, what I've done in previous work is introduce what I call the association operator. It's indicated at the bottom left of the slide. So A of chicken and eat basically means anything to do with chicken and eating. So think of it as being some kind of generalization of the genitive marker. So if it were to apply it monadically just to chicken, it would mean the chicken apostrophe S, something to do with the chicken. Here, when it applies dyadically, what it means is something to do with chicken and eat, but we don't quite know what, go figure. And in particular, there is no association of thematic roles. So basically, we can characterize bare compositionality as compositionality in which the meaning of a complex expression is determined only by the association operator. And contrast that with compositional compositionality, constructional compositionality, sorry, in which the meaning of the complex expression is determined 
by, both by the association operator, but also by further grammatical constraints. And what I'd like to suggest is that the distinction between bare and construction compositionality um, takes on meaning both in terms of complexity, so you can think of constructional compositionality as being more complex than bare compositionality. It's built architectonically, constructional compositionality is built on top of bare compositionality. And in addition, you can interpret this arrow also phylogenetic, that is to say, the hypothesis is that bare compositionality came first, followed by constructional compositionality. So what I'd like to do is present a typology of compositionality, which is given in this table, which I will dwell on uh, in some detail and explain. And basically, the rest of this talk will consist of exemplifying the cells in this table with examples from human language, and to the extent that this is possible from systems of animal communication. So what we see here on the horizontal, the, the columns distinguish between bare and two types of construction or compositionality. Um, so the middle type with the G's is constructional compositionality, which contain a grammatical morpheme. So the G here stands for grammatical. The C in the third and final column stands for configurationality, things like intonation, order elements, and the like. So basically, what constructional compositionality has that bare compositionality doesn't have is these additional types of grammatical markers or configurational markers, which are absent from bare compositionality. But as you can see, all of them build on the association operator, which is common to um, all the different types of compositionality, common core underlying all types of compositionality. So the columns distinguish between bare and two types of constructional compositionality. Now let's turn to the rows. These come into play only within constructional compositionality and the indexes or the superscripts on the G's and the C's, which basically distinguish between simple monovalent and bivalent operators. So the idea is that a grammatical marker is monovalent if it applies to one element, the x. It's bivalent if it applies to two elements, x and y. But it's simple or non-valent, I'm not sure if that's a word, if it just stands alone and doesn't apply in any semantically determined relationship to x. Now, all of this was frightfully complex. Uh, what I'm going to do for the rest of this talk is basically to fill this table out, to flesh this table out with specific examples, as I said, both from natural languages, that's from human languages, and also from animal communication. So let's plunge in to the data. Um, yes, this, uh, sorry, I should have mentioned this um, arrow basically represents the table typology in terms of evolutionary trajectory. So the red arrows um, portray the evolution from bare to constructional com um, compositionality, while the blue arrows uh, represent the rise of monovalent and bivalent relation relational constructionality from simple constructionality. OK. Uh, so much for the abstract gobbledygook. Let's now look at some real examples. And what I'll be doing, time permitting, is um, basically illustrating each of the seven types of compositionality, beginning with bare compositionality, which we've already seen in the Indonesian. And here are some examples from captive apes. Uh, so, as I've argued elsewhere, based on research by others, of course. Uh, I'm not a primatologist myself. Um, when Kanzi uses lexigrams like Liz and Hyde, there's no semantic role assignment. So, some, so if there's a, what we think of as a noun and a verb, they can occur in any order. And in either order, um, the argument can be interpreted either as the agent or the patient. So sometimes you get Liz Hyde, but you also get banana Hyde, where the banana isn't hiding, it's being hidden. Uh, be it Paul, 
Uh, you can also have this pull, meaning this is doing the pulling, but the bed is being pulled. So what you have here is something that looks similar to the checking in example of the deletion. You have back oppositionality. The meaning of the whole is just uh, can be represented in its entirety by the association operator applying to the meaning of its parts. Now, I was actually hoping to find more examples of this in uh, uh, Apes in the Wild, but I didn't find them. The only naturalistically occurring example of this type of compositionality that I was able to discover in animals is rather surprisingly in the well-known wiggle dance of bees. So, uh, as I think many of us know, uh, the bee dance basically consists of two uh, constituents. You can think of them as being constituents, even though they're expressed simultaneously and not in sequence. The direction that they dance in um, represents the direction of the target. The uh, duration of the dance represents the distance of the target from the source. So basically, what you have here are two semantic components whose relationship is described in its entirety by the application of the association operator. There's no constructional compositional semantics. It's bare, it's bare compositional semantics as represented by means of the association. So these are the examples that I have so far, not that many, of bare compositionality in animal communication. I'm sure I've missed plenty of examples, uh, but there aren't really that many. You have to really look hard to find such examples in animal communication systems. The rest of the talk will be concerned with um, constructional uh, semantics, constructional compositionality. And uh, if we look at uh, examples such as this, uh, so in Hebrew, the word for T followed by a diminutive suffix, T, T, L, E. Tagalog, the word for 20, followed by a politeness marker. Basically, the meaning of these is just the meaning of, of its parts, of their parts, with nothing further in terms of the semantics. Uh, so the only difference between these examples and the previous ones is that the forms in question are grammatical. There's a suffix in Hebrew, it's a particle which occurs in a grammatically very constrained position to go along, but basically the semantics is um, associational, but even though it involves a grammatical form. And we have something similar um, described for female Diana monkeys. They have uh, several calls, two of them, but one of them is represented as H, the other one as A. So as described by the authors, H represents a socially positive, relaxed situation. The A is actually a call that is unique to each individual. You put them together, and what you get is just a sum of the two meanings. The only reason that I've put this under construction compositionality is that this is considered as a particular construction in which the A seems to actually be suffixed onto the H as described by the authors. And this brings me to a very important point, which I should have mentioned earlier, and that is that all of these uh, classifications are very strongly analysis dependent. So you get this in linguistics and you get this equally so in uh, the literature on primary communication, that different people have different analyses for the same construction. So in a sense, you might think of what I'm presenting here less as a typology of the actual communication systems per se, but more as a typology of the analyses that have been proposed for these communication systems. We move on to the second type of um, constructional compositionality, and this is um, configuration. So here are two examples from human languages. Uh, the first one is, imagine a boatman on a pier in uh, Indonesia. Um, his boat is about to leave for a place called Balai, and he shouts out Balai, 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 Balai. And what the petition does is convey urgency. The boat's about to leave, he's desperate to get more passengers. So repeating it basically increases his chance of getting more passengers. So you can think of this as being compositionality involving a word but also a configuration, the configuration here being repetition. In English, 
this is what is commonly called up top. So uh, if I'm a typically a valley girl or some other speaker of a specific register of age, I'll say Monday. And it's not a question. It really expresses tentativeness. So once again, what we hit in 10, we have this intonation plus a lexical item combining compos compositionally, but also in a very particular configuration. So these are examples of simple configurational compositionality in ordinary languages, very commonplace mundane examples. And we have something very similar amongst male putty nosed monkeys. So um, basically, as described here, the more hacks you hear, the higher the alarm level is. So in five hacks, you get alarm level five, and hack itself means serious non-ground movement related alert. So basically, these two meanings, the configurational meaning and the lexical meaning, combine to yield simple configurational meaning. And this looks just like the boatman on the pier in Indonesia. It's basically the same thing. And it's very straightforward. Moving on to relational uh, compositionality. So the difference here is that the grammatical marker is relational in the following way. If we look at uh, the diminutive first and thirteen, snav nav, the word for tail in Hebrew is sanav, the diminutive snav nav. But what's crucial here is that it's more than just little and tail. The littleness describes the tail. This is something that's very easy to overlook. But snuff nav couldn't refer to um, a large tail on a tiny animal. So it's not just you have tail and littleness, but the littleness describes the tail. It's this semantic relationship that needs to be described as uh, monovalent. So it's, a, it's semantically relational. And similarly, in 12, here we have an example, a typical example of a preposition, and it means to the shop but the direction is actually describing the direction to the shop. It's not that there's a shop and there's a direction in go figure, which you would get in fair associationality. Here you have something which is actually relational. So these could be described in terms of the association operator plus additional relational description uh, restrictions that derive from the actual grammatical structure. Do animals have something like this? Well, actually they do. Um, so, as Campbell monkeys are described, um, hop um, denotes a non-terrestrial disturbance. U, described as a suffix, denotes attenuation. But crucially, the attenuation here is with regard to the non-terrestrial disturbance. So, if you think of it as being an operator that applies to the non-terrestrial disturbance. So, this example from Campbell monkeys. And the suffix u looks very much like the two previous examples from natural languages. The fifth type of construction configurationality involves um, configurations. So here are two examples that look similar to the previous two that we saw from Indonesian and English, but different in a crucial way. Um, Nilam means dive. Yilam, 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 yilam means drive again and again and again. So why is this like our boatman shouting the destination again and again? Because what's crucial here is that the iteration applies to diving. It, you know, it's so obvious, you can hardly imagine how it could be otherwise, but it could be otherwise. This could, I mean, potentially this could mean dive once and uh, collect lots and lots of different items on the seabed in an iterative way, but it can't mean that. It means that the diving is iterated. So, so what you have here is a semantically constrained relationship between iteration expressed by repetition and dive. In a yes-no question intonation in English, basically the yes-no question applies to the word T. It, isn't, it can't apply to anything else. So once again, what you have here is a configurational item applies to the lexical item. It's constrained semantically to apply to the system relational item. And this is a further constraint on bear association, which is why this is not bear association, but rather monovalent and configuration. And surprisingly, we have something similar, if not identical, from the Guerrero Colobus monkeys. 
So raw means predator. But rules can be repeated in two different configurations. If you have many repetitions, if you have a sequence of many rules, but just a few such sequences that means eagle. If you have few repetitions, but many occurrences of that, of that few, so raw, raw, comma, raw, raw, comma, raw, 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 comma, blah, 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 so on and so forth, then it actually means a, a, a land predator, jaguar or something. So the, the configuration of repetitions and their grouping actually has meaning which combines in a constrained manner to the actual predator. It actually describes what type of predator it is. So one configuration gives you eagle, a different configuration gives you uh, uh, jaguar, whatever the local land predator is. Moving on, uh, I'll just take another minute or two. Um, bivalent uh, constructional configurationality is it's actually language by examples such as this. So here, the preposition, preposition two, you might think it applies just to music, but actually, it's also governed by the verb listen. This is the sort of thing that linguists often call uh, grammatical case as opposed to semantic case and so on and so forth. What you have here is a relationship between the, the grammatical bark of the preposition and, and both of its, uh, uh, both of the elements in which it goes to construction. 19 from Tagalog, the national language of the Philippines, is a straightforward example of a grammatical marker connecting a, an adjective and a noun and basically marking attribution. So here we have grammatical markers that mark bivalent relationships, and so far I have not been able to find any such things in animals. Moving on to the final case, this is um, constructional bivalent compositionality. So here we're looking at a configuration that applies bivalently to the two elements of which it uh, applies to. Um, so here are two Austronesian languages. In Nage, Manu Ka means the bird is eating. Ka Manu means eating the bird. So the word order basically uh, accounts for the thematic role assignment between the verb and its object. The object precedes its agent. The object follows its verb. It's the patient, very common cost linguistically. And you get the same thing in Sri Lankan Malay with regard to the distinction between attribution and predication. So, koton air means dirty water. In the opposite order, air koton would mean uh, the water is dirty. So, here is the configuration that restricts the, um, the, the provides a further constraint on the applicability of the association operator. And indeed, we have something similar, again, amongst male puppy-nosed monkeys. Basically, they have piaos and they have hacks. People talk about the piao hacks of the male puppy-nosed monkeys. But what's crucial here is also the order, namely that the hack comes after the piao and denotes restriction. So piao simply means alert. Hack means serious non-ground movement to make it alert. But the alert denoted by the hack is the one denoted by the piao, so there is a semantic constraint on the interpretation of the composition. So what we have here then is bivalent configurational uh, compositionality. Okay, so basically to sum up, what we've seen then is that most of the types of, comp of compositionality instantiated uh, that can be found in human languages can also be found in animal communication, but much less commonly. What seems to be uncommon in animal communication is not so much compositionality per se, but rather it's building blocks. You don't get many grammatical items, you don't get many configuration signs, and two other items which I didn't mention in this talk, you don't seem to get hierarchical syntax, you seem to stop at the two-word stage, and you don't get large vocabulary. So what I'd like to argue then is that the development from bare to construction of positionality may have taken place independently on many 
separate clades. So in particular, um, what you find within the recent evolution of hominins could perhaps have occurred independently amongst other primates, even uh, amongst non-primates such as bees. Thank you.